Good morning. I'm Ross Ramsey, the executive editor of the Texas Tribune. I'm joined today by Texas controller Glenn Hager. Mr. Hager was elected controller in 2014 and serves as the state's treasurer, check writer, tax collector, procurement officer, and revenue estimator. Previously, he served as a member of the Texas Senate and of the Texas House. He also chaired the Sunset Advisory Commission, which reviews the operations and efficiency of each state agency. Every session starts with the controller coming to the, the day before the session starts, coming to the legislature and telling them how much money he thinks they're gonna have to spend over the next two years and what the condition of their current budget is. Uh, Mr. Hager, you did that on Monday. Can you kind of give us the rundown? What's the situation? Yeah, so, you know, before the pandemic hit and the double headwind of lower oil and gas prices, the state treasury looked in good shape after the last session and beginning of last year, thought we'd have a $3 billion surplus. Of course, after a few months of data, looking at the trend lines and not knowing exactly how deep, how wide, how long the downturn would be here in Texas, the U.S. and worldwide with the pandemic, we released, you know, a new revenue estimate and that was four and a half billion dollar deficit. So a significant swing. Yet several good things that, that trend lines from last year were sales tax collections were stronger than we anticipated while they were still negative each month compared to that month of the year before in 2019. Also online sales were, were better, a little bit less expenses in the foundation school program, public education that is than anticipated. So when I released that revenue estimate on Monday of this week, we went instead to a $1 billion deficit. So that doesn't take into account any type of ex cost reductions of state agencies that leadership instructed. In part, while those are still being retained in the Treasury, the official action by the legislature to essentially reduce those expenditures this session will then be recognized officially. So that's why it wasn't in the revenue estimate, but it pretty much is, we think, is about a billion dollars, which will get us back to almost zero flat, which is good. Really, no one would have anticipated that. Uh, but, you know, the fact is, overall, the legislature is going to have about $112.5 billion in what we call general related revenue, which is the real number that we focus on. And it's about $270 billion when you take all funds, whether that's GR dedicated dollars as well as federal dollars, which for the GRR portion, the 112.5 is about 4% less than it was two years ago. And the real main reason for that is we don't have as large of a cash carryover balance than we did two years ago. Two years ago, it was over four and a half billion. Now, as of the one I released, was like almost a billion dollar negative. So a five and a half billion dollar swing, which really kind of explains why the, uh, the, the, the decrease of this cycle compared to last in part is more that than anything else. Yeah, it's not 4%, it's 0.4%, right? That's right, that's right, 0.4%. Right. So we're basically at a flat number, and I guess you know the growth in the budget from population and inflation might be the only thing really to worry about here. Uh, this doesn't look like the dire budget or the dire fiscal condition that we were in you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I think you were one of the very first people, uh, certainly that I know of, to say the recession word. Um, and, you know, that $4.6 billion when you laid it out um, uh, got everybody a little bit nervous. Um, and they thought they were heading into a really nasty year. What changed here? What was the what looked bad at the beginning that turned out not to look as bad? As you well, thought you know, in the very beginning, I mean, there's no downturn economically that we've ever had in precedent to actually compare to. And right. as somebody quipped to me months ago and they said, wait, you mean the pandemic of 1917 didn't give you a lot of data to go off on in the Texas economy of 2020? Uh, you know, and, and I think you almost lost your Topeka right there when uh, when I said it in part, because, <laughs> you know, when they said that, I thought, OK, I'm going to take that line because, you know, the economy's changed. We're a very diverse right. economy. And so my team, we were looking at all these non-traditional economic indicators, looking at the normal things we would, but they are delayed. And so trying to get a real glimpse of where do we think this economy is going? Now, a couple of things that were surprises here in Texas, as well as in other states, is that sales tax held up better than everybody anticipated. Now, again, I'll repeat, it is negative compared to a year ago. About 5% is what we've averaged over the last three months, but it's not double digits. So right. say a great financial crisis, you really had about 14 months that were down 10% for 14 months. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the fact is not that it's half of what we may have anticipated from normal trend lines of, of recessions. And then also because the legislature last session, 
We had worked on a piece of package of legislation as a result of the Wayfair decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, which has to do with a fairness issue. If you and I go down to the local store and purchase something, we pay sales tax. If we are purchasing it online, you want to make sure that fairness is in the system, that nobody has a competitive advantage online versus locally. And so because of the result of that Supreme Court decision, we had worked on two pieces of legislation with stakeholders, gave it to the legislature, and to make sure that marketplace providers, whether it's eBay, Amazon, Wayfair, Etsy, they collect and remit sales tax to the controller's office, or if there's a remote seller. In other words, somebody's just selling directly online. Right. And, and we originally thought that that would be about half a billion dollars over 12 months. And in fact, the pandemic accelerated online purchases and we were wrong. It was $1.3 billion. So, so that's 1.3 1. that you know you only expected 500 out of. That's right. So that's $800 million more than what we'd anticipated, in part, again, driven by the pandemic and purchases. And so when you take that in effect, as well as sales tax overall was not as negative, but I have to say there are other revenue streams that have continued to be, unfortunately, double digit. You know, those industries that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, whether it's bars, restaurants, the hotel industry, leisure, hospitality, and some of those revenue streams are still double digit compared to what we thought they were going to be, unfortunately, whether it's hotel occupancy tax and or whether it's severance tax collections. You noted in your, both in your cover letter to the revenue estimate and then back in the details uh, that this thing is fraught with uncertainty. You're, you're predicting how much money the state's going to have in the current budget, which runs all the way through August, and then how much money it's going to bring in during the two years that start September 1st. So that's always, you know, a little bit of palm reading, but, but I'm curious if this one is a little bit harder to estimate than others have been. Well, you're, you're guessing correctly. And in part, every revenue estimate, you can go back and pull every single one that I think have been given over decades, whether it's this administration, prior administrations, and you always see words called uncertainty, certain uh -huh. things in there that, that we don't know what's going to happen. The ninth largest economy in the world, 19 percent exports out of the United States, so very, very tied to the international economy. And so things can, drag, can change certain industry sectors where this one, there is just unsurmountable amount of uncertainty. And I highlighted that over and over last Monday. I've continued to repeat that. Now, we think the data that we've provided is the best and most accurate data that we have. However, there are substantial things that can change that one direction or another now more than ever before. What are you watching in particular? Are there particular sectors or particular, you know, I guess, canaries in the coal mine that you've got your eye on? Yeah, I think there's several different things. As the vaccine rolls out, how effective is the rollout? How many people are taking the vaccine? What is consumer confidence as a result of the vaccine? And you know, I get asked quite frequently, what are the industry sectors that are gonna lead us out of this? Now, every industry sector is important, but the one that's most important, Ross, is you and I, the consumer. So the consumer, we're a consumption economy. And consumer confidence is extremely important. There's a lot of money out there that people have saved. Uh, so therefore the question becomes, as, if, as that confidence rises, how quickly does it rise? Could you go in one direction? where revenues are coming in the treasury substantially higher than we put in this revenue estimate. Or if the, if the vaccine rollout takes longer, what happens in other countries, even if we have an effective vaccine rollout in Texas and the United States, well, that's only just part of the world and we're tied to that global economy. So what happens in other countries and is that a drag effect here in Texas and the United States? So I think a lot of it centers around the vaccine, consumer confidence, as well as the question mark becomes, federal dollars to Congress within the first 100 days of the next administration want to do a significant large package uh, in some shape, form, or fashion. We're not taking that into account until the ink is dried because we don't know what that would be. But if they do another infusion of dollars, then that obviously is going to prop up the economy, at least in the short term, and that'll be the direction of the state economy here in the course. So, you know, I lay those out as in, you know, I mentioned over and over that we are continuing to monitor as we always do. If something changes, we'll provide a new estimate. You know, I'm very keen on the, the dates of the end of April, beginning of May, knowing as a former legislator, that's a that's the critical time to put the budget together. And, and as you mentioned, this is a very long outlook. And then two also, maybe the legislature's gone, but during the interim, I've shown in the past that we're willing to provide a new revenue estimate, at least for leadership to give direction to agencies on, on what direction the state is going from the health of the economy. Knowing what you know now, let me put you on the hook a little bit. Do you feel like this is more likely to go 
up in terms of state revenue or go down in terms of straight revenue? Or is this just, this is your best stab and we'll see yeah, how it goes. I'm going to stick with the revenue estimate we got today. You know, we have uh, over, over the uh, Christmas holidays, my revenue estimating team and a lot of my folks at CPA did a lot of work over the Christmas holidays because Congress passed a bill right at the very uh, end of December, right before Christmas. And so they did a significant amount of work to see how that would impact the revenue estimate, what tweaks we needed to make. And so the point being is, you know, we feel confident in the numbers that we've given. And so really we just want to see what's the direction of consumer confidence, the vaccine rollout, what's happening worldwide before I can really answer, do I think it's going to go one direction or another as a deviation from what we provided on Monday? Yeah. Yeah. Let me get you to put your um, old legislator shoes on for a minute. I know that as controller, you're in charge of the income side and not in charge of the spending side. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, is your general sense that, you know, the legislature is going to have the money that they need to keep providing current services and programs? Or are we looking at a session where they're going to come in with the with the the cleaving, cleaving knives out? Yeah, no, I think right now, personally, they're as in good a shape as we could have anticipated back last March, April, May, June, July and August of last year in right. part. Because if you look at this current biennium that, as you mentioned, ends of August of this year, right now it's a billion dollar deficit. But if you take into account the savings that state agencies have retained in the state treasury, that offsets. There's a supplemental appropriation, maybe about one and a half billion dollars. There's a significant size in the economic stabilization fund or the rainy day fund if they don't tap it. Two years from now, we think that it'll have a little over $11.5 billion in it. So there's room for them to use part of that. And then also the federal dollars that we have received for COVID type expenses, not all of those have been appropriated in, in, in this current two year budget cycle. And we have until December 31st of this year, because in the last package, Congress extended that from yeah. December 31 to 2022 21. And so my point being, all those pieces makes this biennium in good shape. The next biennium that at least sets us up for the next biennium that I think they'll be able to make this work within the confines of what we have. Now, that probably means there'll be a, some, some type of a supplemental appropriation in two years. But then I've been around for many sessions. And when is there not a supplemental appropriation? The question is just how big is it going to be? We should say here what a supplemental appropriation here is. That's that's when the legislature comes in and uh, fiddles with the budget to make adjustments for what happened during the past 18 months or so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when the legislature is in session, just the same as for myself, trying to figure out what the economy is going to do starting in nine months and ending two years later, that, that's an extreme long runway. Likewise, on the expense side, whether it's public education funding, small changes in the public education system, whether it's population enrollment, what type of enrollment, as well as property valuations. And then on the flip side, Medicaid, those two are the largest pieces of the state budget. So minor changes in each of those formulas can cause big numbers for the legislature. And so, you know, you're making assumptions. So when you come back in two years later, you tighten up those assumptions. And if there's any expenses that you didn't account for in your assumptions, then you adjust for those. Yeah. One of the fairly bright spots in here is the rainy day fund. We got a question from Sandra who wanted to know, uh, you know, you've heard this question before, how rainy does it have to be to use the rainy day fund? Um, they've got a lot of money in savings right now, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it's it's that's one of the many blessings we have in Texas that, you know, we're we're oil and gas is still extremely important to the state economy. It may not be, you know, the cake, but it's definitely the icing on the cake. It makes it taste a lot sweeter. And that's how we get our money in the state's rainy day fund or state savings account. And so there is a large balance in that. You know, I think the fact is if they need to. The money is there to be able to utilize part of it for one time expenses and or something related to the pandemic. But then also we also need to make sure that there's part of it there for two years from now, because, you know, you never know exactly how rainy that day may be. Uh, no one would have expected a pandemic and we surely don't know what the next two years holds. So obviously it's something that the legislature has as a tool. But then with that being said, we need to always make sure at least we have some balance in there for that next unknown rainy day. Right. You you mentioned the Wayfair decision uh, that the courts made that, and the subsequent legislation that the legislature passed to collect sales taxes for uh, online sales. I'm wondering if going into this session, if there are some things uh, like that that the legislature needs to do to sort of patch up its revenue system and, and fix this tax or tweak that tax. This is independent of other like new sources of revenue. And, and I'm just curious if there's something you're telling the legislature 
uh, hey, watch your back on this. You need to, to fiddle over here. Over yeah, there, there. There, there's always a few things because technology and the economy changes, you know, just making sure that you're you're maintaining your system based on the economy of today. And, and the Wayfair decision is a prime example. Now, I don't think that there's anything out there that would garner that type of money. You know, that that is a one time that's over and done. Right. Thankfully, we did it. Uh, other states, you know, I mentioned pretty frequently that, you know, another state we're compared to sometimes as a sales tax state is Florida. Well, Florida didn't do anything two years ago. And, you know, imagine what they lost out on. And then also from a local government perspective, I mean, local governments over that same time period got another $350 million they wouldn't have received otherwise. And so, you know, thankfully for the legislature for creating that fairness. And I think there's some other small type items from a fairness perspective as we use these devices more. There's more internet activity and making right. sure the tax system is caught up, but there's nothing of significant level like that one piece of legislation they passed last session. Okay. You had an op-ed before you put out the um, revenue estimate in the uh, morning news. It might've run in some other papers as well um, about long-term things that the legislature should be thinking about. Pensions was on your list. Can you talk about that a little bit as we go into a session where they're going to, you know, like always, they're going to write a new budget and figure out a new state policy. And I think as the controller, as the CFO for the state of Texas, you know, I need to uh, always respect, obviously, the legislature and their appropriation decisions, but it's my responsibility to continue to highlight those longer term issues that we have to address. And the more that we don't address them, what happens? The bill gets bigger. And so, you know, in that in that op-ed, I made the notation that, you know, legislature over time took big steps on transportation funding several different times, public education, water infrastructure funding, as well as flood control type funding after Hurricane Harvey. So there's been some good movements, but the pension one is the real one that still concerns me. I mean, that's the reason that, you know, a couple sessions ago, I proposed taking some of the economic stabilization fund money and creating what we call the legacy fund in order to be able to have a way to pay down those unfunded liabilities. No, we're not the situation of Illinois. We're not New Jersey. We're not some of these other states. But the fact is, we don't want to become those states. And we need to make sure either we change our pension system and or funding structure in order that one, the commitment we made to our employees is there, but number two, we don't leave future generations with a large tax bill when we needed to roll up our sleeve. And so the point being in part of that op-ed is, yes, we have issues we have to deal with in this current two-year budget cycle, but knowing what I know now compared to a year ago, we also need to highlight and make sure we're taking those strides for the longer term vision of the state of Texas to make sure our economy and our system functions which is an attractant today, and we want it to continue to be an attractant for people in 10, 15, and 20 years. Is what you're talking about an expensive proposition? If you're, if I'm a, if I'm writing a budget over there in the legislature, am I looking at that and saying, yeah, that'd be nice, but it's, I don't have the money. Well, I think the issue becomes in two years, four years, six years, 10 years, it's going to be a more expensive proposition. And so right. you find a way to deal with it, or do you say, oh no, look at the numbers in two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, or 20, and go, we have no clue how we're ever gonna pay for this. So, you know, you gotta look at that longer term, and when you look at that, that balloon payment on the back end, it looks unfeasible. Then you start figuring out, okay, we're gonna have to find a way to resolve some of this today, and we need to take right. a better strides than what we've done in the past. Okay, okay. Let's talk about the economy a little bit. Um, you were one of the first people to say recession out loud. Um, are we still in a recession? Is this what a recession looks like? Or are we in the early stages of a recovery? How would you characterize this? You yeah, know, I, would, I mean, you're obviously talking to economists all the time to do this, to make this estimate. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was not something that I really wanted to use that word recession. But unfortunately, there was no doubt when you take a downturn that significant, so many businesses are closed as well as people were being unemployed in record numbers. There's no way you can't, unfortunately, know that there's going to be some type of recession. The question is how deep, how wide, how long. Now, in fact, are we in a recovery? Yes, we are. I think the real question, as we talked earlier, is what happens in the next two, three, four months is going to determine whether that recovery continues as well as what is the slope of that recovery. Mm -hmm. What's leading us out? Do you have a feeling for, you know, th this right over here is the way the way out of here? Well, I think, again, you know, it just depends on uh, the rollout of the vaccine, consumer confidence, how we continue to engage in the economy. Early on, we had noticed there was quite a bit of uh, research done in, in part from several different areas that we had noticed that, in fact, consumer confidence was driven as much or more by people's concerns and fears than it was out of government mandated shutdowns. And so, you know, even if you lifted the shutdowns, consumer behavior 
was going to change. And so how do we do things different to instill confidence in people just in our only daily lives to make sure the economy continues to run? And as you look at this downturn, there's there's a lot of discussion now, and it's something we talked internally about very early on, is it for some, it's almost a K-type recovery. So those that can work from home, those are at higher income levels, have that flexibility, they continue in the recovery where those that are in kind of lower income pain, which is more in the hospitality and leisure, which is a huge portion of the economy, they have been disproportionately impacted by this downturn. And until that confidence and that travel, that hospitality gets opened back up to the levels as seen before, that area of the economy is not able to fully recover. And it's going to take a long time, unfortunately, for those areas. And then the question becomes, has our behavior changed enough that what is that duration of that recovery? So when you look at it, I mean, I think it's really important to highlight there's there's a couple of different sectors. It's not everybody down and everybody up. There, right. There's different variations within these industry sectors and income levels of individuals, unfortunately. Okay, okay. Uh, you've said you were in the legislature in 2003, which was a nasty budget year. You were in the legislature in 2011, which may have been the nastiest budget year. Um, and you've said the other day that this doesn't look like it's going to be one of those. Did it at the beginning? And and how's that developed? And you know, and I'm gonna that's a leading question. I'm gonna ask you about the pressure on the legislature for new revenue. Uh, yeah, I would minute. say leading early on, it looked as though this could be a 2003. The question that everybody had was, was it a 2011? And and as a reminder, those that may not realize, in 2011, we entered with about a four and a half billion dollar deficit in the current two year budget, which ended in nine months. And then for the next one to maintain that same level of service, it was another 22 billion dollars. So it was 27 and a half billion dollars, right. and it was an absolute miserable legislative session. When you don't fund enrollment growth in public education for the first time since World War II. Right. That tells you it's a miserable budget cycle. That was the question that many who had been around wondered. You know, we hope that it would not be of that level. It's not to that level. Um, I'm not going to say that really it's a 2003 because I think it's a, it's a much more manageable. But the real question becomes what we don't know, as we said already, the uncertainty of the direction of the economy in the upcoming three months, six months, as those are the foundation for what is the trajectory of the next biennium, which is the major part that we're trying to forecast here. Right. 2003 followed the dot-com bust and 2011 followed the global financial yes. um, shutdown. Um, and there was a lot of pressure on the legislature at the time to find other sources of revenue. Uh, we don't have the same amount of money coming in. Let's talk about this or that or the other thing. There was some early talk this year or last year about uh, everything from legalizing marijuana and taxing it, uh, legalizing casinos and taxing that. I guess there's still going to be some conversation about that. have a question from uh, Heather who says, multiple bills have been introduced to legalize marijuana. Has your office looked at the economic benefits of regulating it rather than maintaining prohibition? I guess she's going at revenues that might be raised. You know, you know, Whether or not you're for it, have you looked at the numbers? Yeah, uh, we've looked at some of it in part, uh, you know, interesting. I don't even remember how it came up. My 15 year old daughter, somehow that conversation come up the other day and I was explaining <laughs> to her that, you know, other states look at it. She probably saw something in some social media, who knows what it was, and asked me the question. I said, well, you know, the reality for us is any dollars that are used in, in that business in other states, they're not in the federal banking system. And so, you know, right. one of the main hurdles is that you need to have an enforcement structure in place, which is much higher in number of people and cost than what it was in the banking system because it's all cash. And so, you know, my point being is just by implementing it here in the state of Texas doesn't mean you're going to replicate what happens in some of these other states. One, they've already done it. Number two, the enforcement mechanism. If I don't have the people that can go out and enforce it, you can pass it and put it in place, but you're not actually going to derive the revenues that you need in the state of Texas to offset, one, any detrimental cost of it being in effect, and then right. number two, to make sure that you were trying to gain the revenues into the system. And so that's one thing that a few members who've reached out to me, you know, I've highlighted that point that, that if you don't have the enforcement side of it, then you're not going to gain the revenue side of it. And because it's not in the banking system, it's very difficult and very hard to enforce. Mm -hmm. Is there a current estimate that you guys have fiddled around with or current 
numbers that you poked out on casinos? No, uh, no, in part. We've done some in the past, but it really yeah. depends on the piece of legislation they pass. What is that mechanism? You know, in fact, as I've, I've kind of mentioned, anything to deal with, you know, you mentioned, will it be brought up? Well, it's brought up every single legislative session, uh, in, in, right. at least since I've been around. And I think it really depends on what what is the legislation that's filed? What does it look like? How much money would potentially be derived in this current biennium? versus the next biennium or the following because it takes a little while for facilities to get built to get open you know so it may not really be an issue for this biennium because of the because of the lag effect depending on the structure upon which they structure it so we haven't because we like to take it on a case-by-case -case basis right. of each piece of the legislation it's not the kind of thing that would save the next budget if you needed to be saved um yeah, I mean, it really it just, again, depends on how they structure it. But, you know, you I mean, I got asked just the other day, again, the dollars that were coming in from the lottery. I thought that was all going to public education. Well, it goes to public education. The issue is it's it's de minimis compared to the overall system that we pay as state state taxpayers and and also local taxpayers. So it's a significant amount of money, but it doesn't solve the overall issue. One of the things that really surprised me in this estimate, and I guess I should have been paying more attention, was the uh, oil and gas revenue. Uh, that part of the economy looks a lot better than it did, you know, back here at the beginning. You know, the to refresh people's memory, we had a a real uh, drop in oil and gas markets in March at the same time the pandemic was coming to town, um, and those income that income looked really really bad which you know plays all the way through public education and higher education all the things depending on the permian basin and other other big fields in texas uh, talk about that a little bit what's going on in that sector so before even the pandemic hit we were noticing a little bit of softness in oil and gas at least from sales tax perspective and part of that is because you know they're having a harder time some of the some of the entities that is for refinancing bank loans and our private equity dollars, not as much money going into uh, you know the shell plays as they had in the past. So you were already noticing some of that. But then, as you mentioned, that that second headwind of, of lower oil prices when Russia and Saudi Arabia did not agree to production cuts, and then Saudi Arabia at the absolute worst time said, we're going to increase production. I mean, I never imagined I'd explain to my kids. I remember having lunch when we were all having school at home back when school was closed trying to explain to them why I was getting texts and messages over lunch. I said, what's going on? I said, well, all prices are negative. And they said, I'm sorry, what? we can't understand that. How, how do you have negative oil prices? And right. so we had, had a whole lot of supply and demand uh, answers at the time. But obviously, it'll take a while for the, the industry to recover. It's an extremely resilient recovery uh, industry. There's, you know, a lot, lot of technology, a lot of capability. You know, we think oil prices are probably going to slowly recover over the course of this year. You know, some are much more optimistic than we are. But, uh, you know, I always remind people that, you know, when they say, well, how certain are you about the oil prices that you put in or the production prices? I usually always mention the NYMEX. If you look at the 12-month certainty of where oil prices are going to be, the 12-month certainty is it's probably going to be somewhere between the low 20s and the mid 80s. Uh, that's a little bit of a gap. And so, you know, uh, the point is those that trade in it, if they're not certain, it just shows you the volatility in that industry sector from the price side of it. So, you know, the fact is, I think, again, the resiliency, there's some more consolidation. The, uh, you know, the Permian Basin is a tremendous asset for the state of Texas, some of the other shell plays. And so, you know, there's a commitment to continue to be here in Texas. And one of the questions becomes, what's going to happen on the federal level from the administration and Congress? Right. You know, is, right. is there going to be some dampening effect which is a very big concern for me and many here in Texas, that that could have a significant impact on the industry and have a ripple effect, unfortunately, into the state economy. Okay. Uh, we just got a minute here or so. Uh, lay out a little bit how things are going to go over the next, we've got a 20-week uh, legislative session. At the end of that session, you sort of lock down the numbers, look at the budget, make sure it balances and all of that, and that'll have a new, uh, maybe some revisions to the revenue estimate. Between now and then, what were we going to hear from your office? What do we expect to hear from your office about how revenues are going now and will be going over the next two yeah, years? Yeah, we'll, we'll continue every month to talk about kind of where we're at from a month-to-month -month basis. Has something drastically changed? You know, looking more so, drilling down into the subsect of the industry sectors, uh, as we always do, but now more than ever. And so, you know, real fact is every month we'll be uh, talking about is there adjustment? And then is there an adjustment that needs to be made at the end of April, beginning of May, which is the very critical time for them to have an adjustment in this budget cycle. And then as we go after session, obviously, it's got to balance up and, and equal up for certification purposes before we send it to the governor. 
And after that, you know, we'll continue like we've always done, uh, monitor the economy. And if there's a substantial change, then we're going to be the first ones to tell everybody. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate your time this morning. Um, uh, you're probably happy that this thing is out and published and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep checking in with you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we're out of time. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And thank you, Controller Hager, for joining us. For more coverage from the Texas Tribune, visit texastribune.org or sign up to get the latest news from the legislature in your inbox at trib.it slash ledge. Uh, thank you, everyone.